Hey friends, Reese here. It's been a while since I've done one of these solo videos, but Brett thought it would be funny to give a Windows handheld to the Mac fanboy who only games on consoles and well, I love it. Now you know from the title thumbnail combo that we're checking out the iNeo 2 with iNeo themselves not being strangers to the handheld market with a couple of familiar favorites like the iNeo Air and the iNeo Next that they seemingly pump out at record pace. Slow down. I bet that before I even finish this review, they'll have a sequel for this one. But they're not doing it for no reason either because they definitely have the support of the handheld enthusiast market. With this launching as an Indiegogo campaign with over 3,000 plus backers as of recording this video. The starting retail price sits at 1099 for the base model going all the way up to 1499 at the high end. It launched alongside the iNeo Geek which is a slightly stripped down version lacking a lot of the premium finishes but still packs a punch performance wise. Both feature an AMD Ryzen 7 6800U, an 8 core 16 thread Zen 3 Plus CPU with built in Radeon 680M RDNA2 graphics. The version they sent for testing comes with 32 gig of LPDDR5 RAM running at 6400MHz and a 2TB M.2 SSD. It has a 7 inch 1920x1260 Hz display that's one of the standout features on this device which I'll actually get into a little bit more later on. Other features include a 4350 milliamp hour battery and a whole host of modern connectivity options like USB 4, Wi-Fi 6 and Bluetooth 5.2. Circling back to the Ryzen APU in the heart of this device, those 8 cores feature a base clock of 2.7GHz and a boost all the way up to 47 It honestly feels like overkill in the little iNeo 2 but that's not really a complete either. With a recommended TDP of 15 to 32 watts, it fits a nice sweet spot for mobile chips with plenty of performance headroom to spare. The screen however is one of the nicest I've used on any device. The 1200p resolution looks crisp and clear at 323 ppi with plenty of brightness at 400 nits. The real star here is the deep contrast of the display because no matter how much I try and film it, it's not going to do it justice. The fact that a lot of people mistake it for OLED should tell you all you need to know. And I absolutely love the fact that it's a completely bezel-less design. It looks amazing with the glass faceplate covering the entire front save for some cutouts for the buttons. Available in both black and white, the iNeo 2 feels super premium. You can tell they put a lot of thought and care into how the handheld feels and looks because there's no visible screws anywhere on the body. You actually have to remove the plastic covers on the side of the device to access any screws. Replacements are available because it's incredibly easy to damage these while prying them off. While the body isn't that much bigger than your standard Nintendo Switch, it's a heck of a lot thicker for both cooling and comfort. Ergonomically it's great, at least for my little baby hands, and speaking of, and I'm quoting here, the state of the baby in the mother's body is natural and comfortable. iNeo draws original and pure inspiration from it for their baby sleeping position grip. That had to go through several layers of approval and that's still what they stuck with. One thing I will praise though is the controls because the joysticks and triggers feature Hall effect sensors which use electromagnetic induction to determine position instead of a more mechanical approach. This means that in theory these joysticks are immune to drift. And as someone who mainly plays on console, I have to say that these are some of the best and most precise joysticks I've ever used, hands down. Layout wise we have a traditional Xbox ABXY setup for great Windows compatibility. They feel nice and tactile with a little click to them, no real complaints here. The other inputs are a cross D-pad, some more Xbox style menu buttons as well as a dedicated iNeo button along with a smaller mappable one right next to it. Up top we have two more programmable buttons next to the left and right bumpers. I use them to do things like quickly pull up the on-screen keyboard or anything I need fast access to. On the left side we have a standard volume rocker and an S3 fingerprint reader for touch to wake that also doubles as the power button. Further along we have two USB-C ports which feature full data and charging capabilities as well as the first of two microphones. On the bottom we have two downward firing speakers. They're not the best, not the worst either, but you have to be careful not to cover them due to their position. I really wish they'd made them front facing but I guess it's hard to do with the all glass design. Moving on, we have one more USB-C port, the second microphone, a 3.5mm combo jack for your gaming headset needs, and a unique hatch mechanism hiding a TF card slot if you ever need to add some extra storage. iNeo actually included a couple of accessories too, like a carry case, thumbstick covers, a screen protector that I haven't even put on yet, and the iNeo multi-docking station, which features a movable USB-C port making it compatible with all iNeo devices. The dock comes in either black or grey with two USB-C ports at the back, with one of them supporting 60 watt power delivery, two USB-C A ports, an HDMI 2.0 port, gigabit ethernet, and an SD card slot on the side. Frustratingly, it doesn't feature a dedicated 3.5mm jack because it blocks off access to the one on the iNeo 2. I use this to basically treat the iNeo 2 like a super switch and have a desktop like experience. Now on the software side of things it's fine. I'm personally okay with using Windows 11 because it's quite Mac like but I also understand it's not everyone's favorite and I get it. Almost everything device related can be controlled and calibrated through the iSpace software. Pressing the dedicated iNeo button brings up the quick tool menu where you can quickly toggle through preset fan curves, brightness, resolution, volume levels and even make TDP adjustments on the fly. Holding the button down takes you to a more detailed home menu with a quick launcher for your most recently played games. Other tabs include your full game library as well as an assistance section that allows you to customize buttons, 
configure the RGB around the joysticks as well as dial in the sensitivity, dead zones, triggers, vibration levels and so on. Now the software is not without its flaws, it's sometimes slow to respond and there's a couple of translation errors here and there. Honestly it's the least polished part of the entire experience and when you're comparing it to something as well fleshed out as the Steam Deck, it's hard not to see its shortcomings. It's basically impossible to review any handle these days without comparing it to the Steam Deck as a solid reference point. On paper the iNeo 2 absolutely destroys the Steam Deck, but it nearly triple the price for the base model in comparison to the cheaper Steam Deck, you'd kind of hope so. I'll compare the performance between the two more thoroughly in a bit once we've gone through some benchmarks to set your expectations. Starting out with God of War 2018, original settings, 1200p, FSR quality and iNeo's recommended 22 watt game mode which is what we'll be sticking with for the most part. Here we're clocking in an average of 29.9 FPS with 1% lows at 25.9 FPS and 0.1% lows at 21.1 FPS. Dropping down to 800p bumps the average FPS up to 43.4. Next up, Hogwarts Legacy at medium settings, 1200p and the same FSR and TDP settings yields an average of 47.9 FPS. While well, dropping the resolution to 800p gets us up to 54.3 FPS. Red Dead Redemption 2 was set to 20 out of 20 on the weird graphical preset scale but looked great while clocking in an average of 34 FPS at 1200p and 48.9 on 800. The Last of Us Part 1 on low came in an average of 32.7 FPS at 1200p and 49.2 FPS when dropping the resolution. Fortnite actually set to high just to see what the Ioneo 2 was capable of with lumen ray tracing because we all know it's going to cap out at 60 on the lower settings. Here I was pleasantly surprised to get 27.7 FPS average on 1200p and 38.3 on 800p but I definitely won't be playing it like this. As for Forza Horizon 5 and Witcher 3 I'll put up the results for you quickly so you can take a look while I catch my breath for what's coming next. Cyberpunk is where I went a little more in depth to show off a comparison between the Ioneo 2 and the Steam Deck because with a graphical preset made specifically for the Steam Deck we get a great reference point on how much further you can push the Ioneo 2 with its TDP options. Starting from the bottom at the 11 watt power saving TDP the Ioneo is practically useless. Being under the recommended spec for the chipset itself it makes even web browsing painful so playing anything more than a puzzle game is kind of off the table. At the 15 watt balanced TDP we're in Steam Deck territory with the Ioneo closely matching the Steam Deck's results while having more cores to power at the same wattage. Once we bump that up to the 22 watt game mode we're starting to pull far ahead of the Steam Deck at equivalent settings. And in pro mode set all the way to the max of 33 watts we're well past the point of diminishing returns and now we're just diminishing battery life. Speaking of battery life it's about what you expect for a handheld. Playing more demanding titles will peg the GPU at 100% giving you about an hour to an hour and a half of playtime. All the games and indie titles will bump that up to nearly three hours if you choose the appropriate power settings. There are some optimizations you can do like using the smart TDP applet within iSpace to set a target frame rate that will then dynamically scale the power and stop CPU boosting so that more of the TDP can be reserved for the GPU. This can give you a nice locked FPS experience when set right and save you some battery as long as you're not asking too much of it. It's not a flawless system by any means, it doesn't exactly benchmark well because opening menus will cause the power draw to drop as GPU demand goes down and it takes a few seconds to stabilize once you're back in the game. I've actually had the system lock up when it dropped too far in a menu but thankfully that hasn't happened since the latest update. So if you don't mind a quick FPS drop when exiting menus you can easily squeeze out an extra 20 minutes or so of battery life in your gaming sessions. Now one thing that the iNeo 2 can do that the Steam Deck can't is use an eGPU thanks to it having used before. I actually have it docked and connected to an RTX 3060 Ti inside the Razer Core X nearly constantly. It's a great way to scale performance up even further but it does have its limitations. You're bound to PCI Express 4 times due to the bandwidth constraints of Thunderbolt 3 itself and this can cause a lot of stuttering in games that are heavy on VRAM. But this isn't exactly an eGPU review itself but more of an experience of using the iNeo with one which is neat. But would I recommend the iNeo 2? It's hard to say when it's not my money. Yes you are getting a more powerful and premium experience over something like the Steam Deck but you do pay for it. And with other handheld options like the ROG Ally right around the corner that at least according to the specs will blow the iNeo out of the water, it's a tough call. I will say though that I absolutely love the device. It feels like it was made for my hands and it will be my handheld of choice for the foreseeable future. I hope this was at least informative to those of you who stuck around. If you have any questions, drop them in the comments down below and I'll answer them to the best of my ability. But yeah, see you guys back on Hot News for UFD Deals. Cheers.